Welcome, everyone. This is Debbie Maber with National Kitchen and Bath Association. If you're just joining us, you're here for our last webinar of the month on sustainable design, and today's session is called, let me just get that for you, it's called Washing Wisdom, and um, this is uh, Dishes to Close, Facts, Myths, and Future with Paula Kennedy. She's a certified master kitchen and bath designer. She's also CLIP certified. Uh, she's the owner of Timeless Kitchen Design. And uh, before I get her started, I just want to thank Ebert for uh, sponsoring all of our webinars this month. And Paula, if you're there, we are ready to get started. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. And good afternoon if you're on the East Coast or in the middle. Uh, it's fun talking to so many different time zones. Being on Zoom meetings uh, for the last month has been fun checking in with all my peers across the country. And so it's wonderful to have you all gathering today. Gebret, thank you so much for sponsoring um, the sustainability topics for this month. We really appreciate and um, hope that you know, you know we wouldn't be able to be offering this content without your support and NKBA for offering um, these free CEUs and free webinars to our members. And especially now is a fantastic time to be brushing up on your education and, and whatnot. So thank you. And thank you, Debbie, as always. It's so wonderful working with you in um, creating and developing and, and, and then coming here today to be able to uh, present to all of you. So thank you for the introduction. So let's dive in, let's dive in. You know, as all of my CEUs that I've developed over the years, it all starts with personal desire for more knowledge. Um, for how do I use things in my own home? How can I help my clients? You know, what, what habits and things can I change in how I do things? And, and then during that research, like, well, okay, maybe I need to be offering this to my peers and to the industry. and there are some tips and tricks I'd love to share today. So um, I, I think all of us that teach or write or do these different things, you know, it's, it, it's definitely a very, personal, a very personal story as well. And um, let's, let's get started. So I want to start with our why. Why are we here today? We're here to talk about our families our families and why, why the, these items that we wear, we're gonna talk about the clothes and food, uh, clothes and dishes. And you notice I didn't you know, label this, um, uh, the CEU, you know, dishwashers and washing machines, right? Um, really, it's more than about the machine. It's about what the machine is doing for us and supporting our lives, right? So the clothing that we wear, it's for comfort, for protection and expression for you and your family and your clients. And we want those clothing items that we'd love and save forever, especially, you know, that college sweatshirt that you want to last forever, but you still wear it to death. How can we make those items last longer? Therefore, saving money so that we're not always repurchasing, you know, the next fast fashion, which we're going to talk a little bit about. Um, and then, of course, um, we are also the month of April talking about sustainability and both of these appliances are just such a perfect fit for this conversation because both deal with water and with energy and safety, safety in terms of the germs that are in our lives and how can we um, keep our family safe by what they're wearing. The same is true with our dishware. The dishware is like the foundation of of our health, our nutrition, right? It's what serves up the nutrition to our families. It's how we um, serve up self-care for ourselves um, or comfort food. <laughs> I could have added comfort in this slide too, right? And those things create connection with our families and with friends and with neighbors and, and in our lives. And there's traditions behind those. There's traditions of dishware that's passed down from generation to generation. And again, how can we save money, um, especially with water and with energy, um, with these appliances and safety? How can we make sure that our dishware has been sanitized and that we really are getting rid of germs? So now we know our why, what we're here today. 
And these are some of the things that we're going to touch on as we move through the next 50, 55 minutes or so to answer those whys. And again, I really want you to be thinking about, this isn't just about the consumer, this isn't just about your client, because you are the consumer. And if we learn these items and practice some of these new tricks in our own homes, it's easier to turn around and go back out and educate our clients too, right? So I know it can be really confusing. We are going to, um, appliance stores and looking online, and there's this plethora of the alphabet soup, I call it, <laughs> and all these labels and all these codes and different things, right? I know it can be really confusing. And most of us are really super familiar with the energy guide, that yellow label, right? We're familiar with that. And even I found this uh, image, of course, with our Canadian members and with the inner guide, and, but we need to really delve a little deeper than just some of these baseline minimums and find out who the real stars are. So I went to the Energy Star, uh, which is a level above the Energy Guide, and did some research and did some poking around. And this chart that we see, and I'm going to talk about uh, washing machines first for this particular chart. And I expected to see water standards talked about in gallons, right? Because that's what we're used to. We're used to thinking about gallons in the dishwasher and gallons per, you know, minute and showers and faucets. But what's this WF? Um, water factor. WF is a water factor. And it's just uh, the calculation, you know, how much a uh, washing machine uses, um, you know, uh, multiplied by or divided by the cubic feet. And then that gives us our water factor, right? So, this chart says the water factor is six, should be six. Now, again, remember, this is not the minimum energy guide. This is the water sense standards. You'll also notice this was in 2011. Okay, let's go back to work and see if we can find something a little bit more current. So then I found a report, uh, new codes on 2018 tried to find something even newer, and this, is, this was what I found. So we went from six water factor to anywhere from 3.2 to 3, uh, 4.3 um, for different types of washing machines. So that's quite a jump from 2011 to 2018. So you can see, you know, yes, we are definitely trending towards, um, the industry is trending towards um, pushing us towards less water in our water appliances that obviously need water to run, right? Um, let's look at dishwashers. So dishwashers, um, again, in 2011, we were for water sense. Remember, this is water sense, not the minimum energy guide. Um, was at five gallons. Another number I found in 2012, only a year uh, a year off from that was 4.25 gallons. Okay, what do we have that's newer? Again, in 2018, a standard size dishwasher for water sense is now 3.5. Uh, uh, so we went from five gallons to 3.5 uh, since 2011. Um, a few years ago, I actually was uh, working with and doing some more pre prior research um, on dishwashers, and I remember sitting down with the engineer and saying, okay, so there's this trend of reducing water. What's next? And I'm gonna try to, like later on in this, later on today, try to touch on what's next, what we are, can kind of see might be coming, right? And, and at, at some point he said, we still need water to clean. At some point, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, we have to find other ways to save or, and it was an interesting, it was an interesting, uh, and it would be interesting to hear what he has to say now, because I think there is some new technology and some new ideas about how we could, because we, we know it's going to continue to get reduced as we move forward. So as we're doing all of our research, right, we really need to kind of do our own, right, and know who to trust. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with AHAM, Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers. Um, I've become friends with them over the last 
uh, five years or so and have met them uh, personally at KBiz a few times and have been on a few KB uh, Twitter, uh, KB Tribe chats with them. And um, they have some, a great consumer blog, but it's also a great source for us as specifiers um, that we can pass on, that we can learn ourselves and whatnot. So definitely check them out. And you'll see I added their, their label here, the verified, the AHAM verified. So know who to trust as you're doing your research. Just because it's the most popular report does not necessarily mean it should be your go-to. So I said I was going to try to bust a few myths out there. And it's just, just uh, an overview of a few things that I really want you and your clients to think about. Most brands can say that they meet the minimum standards. Meeting the energy guide standard is uh, pretty much a given for most in the market, right? But let's not assume that minimum is good enough. Remember back to our why. This is our family we're talking about. This is your kid. This is your mom. This is, this is us. This is, this is our family we're talking about. Is, good, is minimum good enough? We deserve more and so do our clients. So we need to become a lot more familiar with the luxury brands that go above and beyond the minimums. And as I uh, started this research, that, that was the, the, the niche, the luxury brand, brands are the ones I really am focusing on for the CEU. So this is not a every single brand, this is not, you know, from the lowest cost to the highest, this I am really focusing on the top here. Many sites, and I think I said this a, a minute ago, many sites that review products are not regulated by industry codes or testing regulations. So as you're doing your research, as your clients are doing your research and they bring you the report, ooh, hey, I saw on this report that these are the best ones, let's take it with a grain of salt. You know, are, are their testing methods actually regulated? Who's paying for the ads? in the marketing and whatnot. Okay, so the other thing that I did to prepare for all of this and to get myself educated, I sat down with Andrew, my local appliance, my appliance guru, <laughs> my appliance expert and sales guy, and I, I asked him, what, when clients, when consumers walk into your front door here at the, at the appliance store, what are they looking for? What are they asking for? What are those trends of what you're seeing that constantly one after another that they're asking for? And this is what he shared with me. Both washing machines and dishwashers, they definitely want the bells and whistles. They are enamored with the bells and whistles. Uh, we all have good intentions <laughs> that once we get that kitchen remodel done, I'm not gonna put anything on that countertop anymore because now it has a place to go, right? And you come back six months and there's things all over that countertop. Well, <laughs> we are all enamored with the features and all the buttons and all the different special um, cycles. And the reality is we actually need to learn how to use those if we want to answer our why, if we want our clothing and our dishes to actually work uh, last longer. Okay, so they're, they're drawn by the features. For dishwasher, number two uh, was the energy savings. Um, how can I save energy on my electric bill um, was really the question that came, um, came up after that. And third for dishwasher was kind of hand in hand, quality and price. They were both, you know, kind of neck and neck right there. Now with washing machines, price was number two and then capacity. And what was interesting, Andrew said that washing machines have still, you know, on the average consumer, still really kind of fell into this like commodity that, that wasn't really seen as a luxury. It's a necessity and it's about price. Um, and then of course, capacity. And there is this uh, another myth, which we'll get to, and that larger is better. <laughs> so now I can't help, but as I'm doing my research, I, I, I always like to dig into what are the definitions, what's the engineering, what's, how does everything work, where have we been, where have we been, where have we come from, and I think it's beautiful to look back and see where we've come from. 
and I love the colors. Um, and these ads, a lot of these ads came up during my research. And, you know, this one, um, this, the second one in with the blue dress and it has the white top load that's mobile. My grandmother had one of these. So if you talk about connection and tradition, when we're talking about dishware and dishwashers, you know, that brought back memories of, you know, helping my grandmother, you know, load the dishwasher and roll it over you know, to the sink so you could hook up the hose. And um, I, being small, it was hard to reach down in and get the dishes from the bottom, you know. That really brought back a, a lot of memories. <laughs> now, this is not necessarily historical, but I kind of found it histor uh, hysterical. Um, I love the Maytag man, so I had to throw him in. <laughs> also, um, of course, the timeline on the inventions and the development of the dishwashers is a long one. And there were many different types of manual and different um, uh, dishwashers that actually came before this one that I'm showing you here. I zeroed in on this one because of a, two, uh, because of a couple things. First, it's an automatic dishwasher. So we've gone beyond the manual, um, the manual stage, right? It's automatic. The second was is that it's the first commercially successful. And when I thought about what defines commercially successful is that A, it can be reproduced fairly simply, right? It can be um, distributed. It works and doesn't keep breaking down, right? Because my uh, appliance guy, he's like, if it breaks down all the time, I'm going to have a hard time wanting to sell it. And he doesn't even talk about it if they keep getting service calls, right? So it's commercially successful. And so I think it's beautiful um, that it was um, a woman who uh, launched this in 1893 at the World's Fair in Chicago. So our dishwasher has goals. And when it comes off the manufacturer plant, comes out and delivers to us, it has goals. It wants to heat the water to 130 to 170 degrees. It wants to sterilize and remove germs and bacteria. It is made, it wants and is made and is manufactured to do all these things, to spray and loosen food. And it is created in a way to support the detergent in doing its job. And I think that's important with how I say that. The dishwasher is made to support the detergent in doing its job. The detergent is a key factor in how the dishwasher works or doesn't work. And then, of course, efficiently dry dishes. So as we talk about sanit sanitizing, um, which is a hot topic right now, isn't it? Um, and I think for many of us with, with kids and families, you know, it really always has been, but it's just, there's a light shining on this right now, okay? So again, our friends from AHAM, um, I kind of just grabbed this uh, post that they had on Twitter the other day about sanitizing our clothes and dishes. And the NSF, which um, I looked at, National Sanitation Foundation, um, certified that appliances must kill 99.9% .9 of microorganisms. Uh, so you will also see uh, their logo occasionally as well, which uh, we are not seeing there, but that's okay. Um, the other thing with, dish, uh, with dishes is capacity. Everybody is concerned, or what's the capacity? How much can I fit in? You know, and um, really, it boils down to how many place settings. And this is how manufacturers test capacity. And this is how they define, for dishwashers, how this is how they define capacity, is based on place settings. You have a dinner plate, dessert plate, single glass, soup bowl, teacup with saucer, and, a, and cutlery. Now, most of us are not putting an entire place setting of each, you know, of each thing in there, right? but it just gives you an idea of how much actually fits. So our lovely 18 inch you know, dishwasher can hold up to six to eight and 18 inch dishwasher definitely has its uh, time and a place in our lives and our clients' lives and in different spaces. Our standard 24 inch that we're used to, 
And again, I'm looking at the mid to high end and more into the luxury um, brands. We're fitting 12, 14, I saw one at 15, and I can't remember how many now, but there were, uh, you know, it got narrower and narrower how many um, actually at the top actually um, can, can do 16 place settings. As a designer, I really, I mean, you've probably already gathered, and if you've listened to some of my other CEUs, I like to get into the nitty gritty and the how. The how and how is it built, and let me in, let me, let me see, let me poke around and see how it works, right? So if you haven't been on a job site recently, let's say well, I've been in the industry for 22 years, and um, if it's been, you know, 10, 15 years since I've watched a dishwasher install, you might want to go out and do it again because manufacturing has changed and there's a lot that's changed um, in the hookup. And we're not going to delve in today with installation issues. I've got um, lots of other lovely things I want to talk about uh, uh, with you today. And this next slide, I really want to kind of this will be kind of our one deep dive into the actual machine. Now, my disclaimer here is um, I'm going to click on this and it's going to take me to a 360 degree view that I hope to be able to share with you. I do understand with technology, there might be a lag. Uh, your own Wi-Fi or broadband may not um, follow me during this which is why I'm also giving you the link to this so you can go um, and do it again later yourself. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time with this. So if your screen kind of freezes or it's blurry and it doesn't, don't worry, I'm gonna come right back out, okay? And, and hopefully this will work uh, for some of you because I decided I wanted to pretend that I was the Maytag man and that I'm sitting inside the dishwasher. I do not remember which manufacturer website I found this on or whether it was on YouTube or whatnot, but I really found it fascinating. There's a silverware tray on top and it's a lovely stainless dishwasher. We can see the water outlet for that middle rack. We can look down and see the spray arm on the bottom. And I can pretend like I'm the Maytag man sitting inside. I mean, how often do we get to do this? <laughs> All right, let's jump back. Okay, I apologize if that didn't work for everyone. Maybe, hopefully it worked for a few, but please go uh, click that link later and, and, and try it out on your own. It's kind of fun. And maybe I'm just weird and I geek out at some of these things. So. You're going to see this theme of reducing water usage and the question of, well, how can we keep getting our dishes clean if we're reducing water damage, right? And that was my question. Like, well, how can we do this? How, how does the machine actually, now that you only have 3.5 gallons, not per minute, you guys, per second. Okay, I just saw a comment. Um, I, I can do that at the end. I will uh, copy and paste that link into the chat at the end if Debbie um, reminds me. Okay, uh, sorry. So I'm like uh, 3.5 gallons per cycle. And I think this is one of the things we have to remember. It's not per, um, per minute, it's per cycle. Well, I know that my dishwasher takes a while to work, right? And he, was, and he said, yeah, because we use less water now, so we have to increase the time, which is one of the complaints with, the, with um, consumers, right, is the length of time has increased on both our washing machines and dishwashers. Because we have less water, we have to make it, you know, we have to, to do this longer. And how, how is that done? It's recycled, that water uh, in the dishwasher is recycled and it runs through a sensor um, that works with and that works with heat. So let's talk. I'm, here's another little uh, geeky thing that I found for us that I really enjoyed: turbidity sensors. So all of our high-end dishwashers now, if it has an auto um, an auto sense, 
or an auto cycle, because I'm always questioning all these cycles and these buttons you guys put on here, do they actually work? And what happens if I use the auto cycle? How does it know that the dishes have been pre-rinsed, <clears throat> which shouldn't be, or that they're really super dirty? Like, how does the dishwasher know? How is it that smart? It's the turbidity sensor. And the term turbidity itself is a quality of being cloudy or thick or having um, particles in the water that makes it clear or cloudy, right? And it's the common uh, measurement for testing water quality. High turbidity means that it's murky and there's a lot of particles in there, right? Low turbidity, um, nearly clear. So there is actually a little photo transistor, a little infrared um, laser that the water is running back through when it's going through to be um, filtered. And it runs past this little camera, so to speak, and it measures how clean or dirty the water is. And that tells the machine to run it on another cycle or not. I thought that was fascinating. Let's talk about jets. There's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot out there now, especially uh, in the luxury market and especially in the last few years. Um, now, if we were looking at mid-range um, jets, mid-range manufacturers, sorry, the number of jets uh, were typically ranging from about 25 to 35 jets, and that means each outlet, right? That means each little hole that the water comes out of. Um, we have, a, where I'm living right now, it's a stainless interior, at, it's probably from a box store, so it's not it was probably um, entry level, and it only had 18 jets. A lot of the luxury manufacturers are ranging between 60 to 102 jets. One I found even had 140 jets. Now, all of these are coming from things like the silverware jets or bottle jets and side sprays. Most, all, most of the luxury brands all have three arms, spray arms these days. Not just top and bottom, but there's three, uh, top, middle, and bottom. But as I was doing my research and talking to everyone, I realized it's, it might. Yes, it's great to have that silverware spray, and I really, really, really want the one with the bottle jets because I have you know, all my water bottles and my cycling bottles and whatnot. But it might not just be about the number of jets. It might also just be about the water pressure. Most dishwashers have one outlet uh, uh, inlet supply for the water. And then the water has to be piped up to where these, um, uh, the spray arms are, right? And so it's all about water pressure. Well, there was one in the market that I found recently, and it's in a luxury brand, that when the water outlet came, uh, inlet supply line came into the dishwasher, it, they split it and ran it to the top and the bottom. And so now there was more pressure coming in from the top. So their supposition was the more jets there are, the more places they have to push this water to, therefore the less water pressure there is. So that was an interesting idea. I'm not necessarily saying one is better than the other yet, but it was, it really made me think. And it's like, okay, again, you know, are we enticed by all the bells and whistles or how does it really work? The racks, we are all familiar with most of these. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Um, they are all adjustable. Uh, most of the high-end lines have the silverware tra uh, tray now. Um, most are also removable and adjustable, and you can move these things every which way to get that big turkey pan in there if you need to, right? <clears throat> um, I was really uh, curious, of course, not, you know, not knowing how these things work, um, with, with seeing this element, like, well, how do you get water to that middle rack, the middle spray arm? Well, obviously, and once I looked in and saw it, I was like, oh, yeah, that's how you do it. Um, it's just simply the, the, that rack slides back onto that outlet and therefore the water reaches that middle arm. So I, did, I definitely did my research in talking about um, 
uh, or asking clients and, and consumers and myself uh, included, we, we can be our own um, petri, dish, petri dish here, right? <laughs> and asking, you know, what is frustrating to me? Um, and I was often frustrated with how the dishes are wet when they come out, not understanding the drying process and, and a lot of the mid-inch, mid-level uh, dishwashers not really having good options. And so how do you dry your dishes? Now, dishwashers have come a long way and they've tried a, multi a multitude of methods in the industry to help us with the drying process because none of us like opening up that that drawer with wet dishes and it just gets all over everywhere, right? None of us like that. And I still sometimes open it up and there's a little bit of pool of water on top of the coffee cup or whatnot. So it was fascinating to me to learn how um, manufacturers are, are, are creating this. And I'm not gonna, you know, repeat or even be able to repeat the, some of the science and, and the vocabulary correctly with, with how these, this, this method works. But, you know, we've seen the pop open doors um, and there's, you know, air vented dries and different things. But this new, newer method, and most of my clients are, are worried about the cabinets. They're worried about the underneath of the countertop. And what if my countertop is butcher block or, or, or hardwood? Um, what happens with the moisture there? And so the, the systems that are coming, that are beginning to work really super well, and I'm gonna go back to that first slide because I think some of these images show it better. So um, many, a few of the new higher end dishwashers, they have a super hot cycle at the very end to heat up the dishwasher as much as possible at the very end, creating that heat, right? And then when the door pops open, some of these have auto open. Um, that heat, heat rises, right? Heat rises and it wants to escape and continue going out, right? So the heat, and you can kind of see in these images kind of that red, red foggy, you know, that's kind of coming out at the top. It's creating a barrier. And here's where I'm lacking like the scientific language to describe this, but hey, let's keep it simple, right? That heat, is escaping first and creating a barrier that as that steam comes out, it's coming out underneath it so that it, it's protecting the underneath of the countertop. Um, this one brand in particular was talking about, it's about a five inch gap that opens so that the heat kind of captures and pushes the, the condensate, you know, the, the steam out forward so it's not hitting the countertop. Um, I am positive I'm not explaining that correctly, but I think you get it. Uh, <laughs> so I have also learned to not open the dishwasher too soon. I think it's done, right? But it's still doing its drying cycle. And again, I'm working with a mid-entry level uh, dishwasher and not a high-end one. So here's my challenge to us today. We need to stop wasting water and learn how to scrape and load. Scrape and load, let's make it our new hashtag, okay? So what am I talking about? I'm talking about pre-rinsing our dishes. Pre-rinsing our dishes and or washing dishes. Um, uh, if you've got a dishwasher, you're not washing them, but pre-rinsing, I'm really focused on pre-rinsing here. So I grew up pre-rinsing our dishes. That's just what you did because for whatever reason, the dishwasher didn't work very well, right? We pre-rinsed. You know how hard that habit is to break? Seriously, that is extremely hard habit. Even though later on, I'm getting educated as a kitchen bath designer that the detergent needs food to break down the enzymes. And if the food isn't there, it's attacking the, the finish, right? Oh, you know how hard it is? Ah, so this is first perspective. Because we want to save water, not use more, correct? So just for perspective, a kitchen faucet will use one and a half to 2.2 gallons per minute, per minute. An older faucet may use as much as seven gallons per minute. That is a ton of water that we are wasting as we are um, rinsing, pre-rinsing our dishes. 
it's a hard habit to break, but we really need to. And I remember my mom said, yeah, but the dishes are still dirty or there's still food on them or, you know, the reality is, you guys, even if we ran the dishwasher twice, let's say we run a full cycle twice. Remember, now, if it's a water sense machine, it's only using 3.5 gallons of water per uh, cycle, right? Even if we run it twice, we are still using way less water than if we pre-rinsed or even washed our dishes by hand. I mean, that, I hope that this sinks in. For those of you uh, that still have this habit, I hope that this sinks in because we need to change. And this is where I really talk about, like, we as the specifiers and people in the industry, we need to start practicing and learning these methods first so that we can turn around and tell our clients about them. Because they don't want to be wasting water, but do they understand how and where they are? So scrape and load. Scrape and load. I've touched on a few um, frustration points that our consumers have. Let's talk about a couple more. So remember all that pre-rinsing that hopefully you're not doing, right? Um, <laughs> but the dishwasher is hooked up to the hot water. Okay, so if you have just, if you have just uh, used all the hot water in pre-rinsing, now the dishwasher has to work that much harder and use more energy to get to the temperatures that it needs to reduce and kill bacteria and the germs and the, and the toxins that are in our dishwashers and our, our food and our dishes, right? So now the dishwasher has to work harder. So we're increasing the amount of energy it has to use. So again, scrape and load. Stop using all your hot water before the dishwasher needs it. It's kind of like don't run the dishwasher before your husband goes and takes a shower, right? The same is also true that if you want to help the dishwasher, prime the pump. Turn the hot water on at the sink for a minute. Get the hot water there, especially if your hot water heater is far away from the kitchen um, or if it takes a while. Every home is different, right? Prime the pump with that hot water. Get the hot water to the sink. That way when the dishwasher turns on, um, it doesn't have to work as hard to heat it up. There's lots of little things we can do to help our dishwasher work better. <laughs> so let's take a bird's eye view of our bottom of the dishwasher here. One of the other frustration points that our clients are coming back with is it's smelly. It's smelly. It's a dishwasher. Why? There's no food in there. Why? Why is it smelling? Um, there are little food disposers or little internal garburators and filters. Uh, some dishwashers just have the food uh, disposer, some just have filters. If I remember my research correctly, there are some that actually have both and they go hand in hand. Guess what? This is another one of those items that we need to help the dishwasher be better. We need to empty that filter out. And those of you that have been in the industry long enough have probably heard this. I hope that you do this at home. This is a fantastic reminder for me that I need to go and look at the one that I have here at the house and probably needs to be redone, be uh, re emptied because I don't remember the last time I did it. So it probably needs to be done. So again, it's, it's uh, a frustration point, but it's easily solved. I often wondered, especially when there was a whole shift between, you know, the plastic tubs and stainless is, uh, you know, okay, they cost more. Um, what's the benefit? Is it just for looks or is it actually for function? So surprisingly, not surprisingly, but thankfully, there actually is a fantastic, you know, fantastic reasons for them. Um, yes, they are a little bit more expensive than plastics, which is why plastic tubs remain so popular, especially here in the US. In Europe, they only do stainless. Here in the US, we had plastic tubs for years because they were less, they were less expensive, therefore more attainable, more accessible to the cons consumer um, expense-wise, right? The stainless actually um, stays hotter, so it retains more heat, especially at that last high heat 
cycle that it does, goes into before uh, drying, it retains that optimum heat transfer um, in the stainless and um, helps that drying process at the end because we need that heat at the end. It also looks pretty nice at the end when it's all clean and it resists streaks and stains and odors. Odors, uh, plastic tubs, plastic is porous. Therefore, it can absorb smells. Some of us across the country have different types of water and you and your clients need to understand where, you, where you're at and, and what uh, challenges you have um, at your own, in your own um, uh, counties and whatnot. Um, a hard water versus soft water. Um, a hard water, just super quick, you know, it's just a mineral content, there's a buildup. The solutions for either is that we might need, for hard water, we might need more detergents. And we might actually need to learn more about water softeners as well. For soft water, we might need less detergent, therefore extra rinses. Now the manuals of our dishwashers will help, but we also probably need to uh, look up and we may even be able to uh, look up on, on, online with the manufacturer or locally to find out you know, what other solutions. But it's, it's usually just more or less detergent and either extra rinses or water softeners. Yes, this happened. Attack of the bubbles. This actually happened to me um, a few years ago. My mom was visiting and she did the dishes after dinner and, and she just grabbed, you know, the first thing she saw under the, under the sink cabinet, you know, and it said dish soap. So, you know, and there's all these new types of detergents now and she thought it was just some new, you know, detergent. And um, of course it was the wrong type of soap and it took us forever to <laughs> get the, all the, the bubbles out and the soap and had to do so many, um, about I think four rinse cycles um, to get rid of all the bubbles. So we do need to be, we do, we do need to be careful what detergents we are using. <laughs> and speaking about detergents, now remember, she thought there was some new fancy thing, right? Because we grew up using Cascade powder, Cascade powder. That's what I grew up with. That box, talk about some memories. I grew up with that box under the kitchen, the, the kitchen sink. Um, most of us know back in 2010, phosphate spates were, were banned. Um, today, the most common active ingredients, um, bleach eradicates stains and enzymes eat away at the protein oils and solids, right? So a lot of people were familiar with, and this could definitely be very generational. Uh, we were more familiar uh, with the powders and gels and they're less, less expensive. However, it's hard to measure, uh, the spills are easy, and sometimes it doesn't dissolve all the way, right? So enter the new tabs, packs, pods, gel packs, um, whatever you wanna call them. So I, there are a lot of brands out there. I'm you know, focusing on Cascade because this is what I grew up with. And back when I was first researching dishwashers, and I was frustrated with how mine at the house is working. This is one of the things I switched. I stopped using powder and I switched to uh, the Cascade Platinum and or other um, tabs or packs or whatnot, right? So I didn't have to measure any now. I, there was less waste. I didn't have um, any spills. And most of the manufacturers are really focusing on this type of detergent dispensing. Um, there are some that are going above and beyond this now and having some auto or preloaded detergents as well. The other thing that I had to change with my habits was to add um, a rinse aid, which of course has nothing to do with rinsing. Um, you can probably more think of it that it's, it's an active aid with the drying, right? But it's removing the water from the dishes. It's uh, kind of creating this, it's like Rain-X on your windshield, okay? so. I did two things. I started using, my mom never used Rinse-Aid, so I didn't, right? So I started using Rinse-Aid and I started using the, the pods. This mid-entry uh, mid level dishwasher that I have here in the house works beautifully. Ever since I made those two changes, 
it works beautifully. So most of, most of the frustrations that we and our consumers have with this appliance, so much of it we have control over. And that's what I really want to drive home. And that's what the manufacturers want us to understand is we can only do so much. You guys kind of have to help. <laughs> Leak management. And we're going to wrap up, uh, move on to uh, washing machines here. Leak management, we need to make sure there are some, especially in the luxury market, we have uh, manufacturers that are offering um, a shutoff now, not just a tray, not just a sensor, but actually a shutoff. And there were three that I found. Um, I can't say that there's for sure that there not, might not be more, but there were three manufacturers I found for sure that had that shutoff feature. Uh, Obviously, technology is there. I'm not going to spend any time on it because most of us have sat in on um, technology um, CEUs here within KBA, but obviously this is a thing. I just want to touch real briefly on, again, that, that conversation about what's in the future. What if they continue to reduce our, our, our air, uh, air huh, water? Um, enter possibly, right? Possibly. There are companies out there, of course, they're brainstorming and thinking about what's next. Dehumidif dehumidifying might be the next thing. This one is actually absorbing uh, moisture out of the air, coming down into the system, using that water for the, uh, to clean the dishes. And then, of course, this is a whole life cycle type of a, a, a unit, you know, where then um, the organic waste is turning into the energy that runs the machine. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, what baby steps we have between that, you know, between where we're at now and this. Um, can't wait to see where we're at. Uh, let's talk about the fab. What's the, that um, ad, the fabric of our lives? Um, <laughs> let's talk about our clothes. Again, had fun. I, um, I knew I had too much that I wanted to talk about to really get into the nitty gritty of the history and where we've come from. But I really want to jump into, you know, a lot of us, we have all of our favorites or we're tired of spending money on things that don't last, right? And there is an entire movement um, that's been going on for years now um, about downsizing and more um, like um, essentially, you know, kind of curating our wardrobe and curating the things in our life that we love and purchasing that item that might be a little bit more expensive, but we want it to last longer, right? Now I saw, this is a great book, Project 333. She talks with Courtney Carver, talks about the capsule wardrobe. And I guess that's all great, but if I don't know how to care for my clothing. How are they going to last? How can I actually save money that way, right? Also, during my research, I thankfully, um, as, as we are all thinking about sustainability and how all of our actions affect the earth, there are a lot of documentaries and things out there to help us understand our impact. This is one of them, and I hope you look it up. I either found it on Netflix or you might find it on YouTube documentary called The True Cost. Talks about fast fashion and where um, a lot of this clothing, you know, the quality of the clothing and, um, you know, where it's made and its impact on the world. I'm only just going to pull out a couple points out of, you know, what I learned there that now I, I think I'm being good at downsizing and sorting and organizing my life, right? And I have all these clothes to go donate. Okay, I don't throw them away. I go donate them. I'm being responsible, right? Statistically, only one out of every 10 of those items that I donate are actually going to be resold. The rest end up in landfills. And most of those landfills are in other countries until they say no more. Now, the factories that are creating some of these clothes for us, there are roughly 40 million, that's huge, garment factory workers worldwide, the majority of whom make less than $3 a day. The challenge that most of these factories have is that they're not privately owned. They are, a lot of them are run by uh, their government. And so we really have no control over how most of those factories are run. 
So just like the dishwasher, um, we, and maybe even more so with the washing machine, Andrew really wanted me to understand, you know, instead of focusing on all the, you know, all the how does the dishwasher, you know, how does the washing machine work and why is this and compare it to this. And we really need to focus more on the fabric care, right? How can we, how can I reduce dry cleaning? How can I make my clothes last longer and reduce water and energy in my home? Back to our why, right? Breaking it down. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you get inside the washing machine drum. <laughs> You know, it really all comes down to one of the big topics right now is top load versus front load. You know, which one is better? Everybody has different ideas. And it really can be pretty challenging to judge because it depends on which manufacturer you're judging against which. And what are the testing, um, uh, what are the, the testing regulations and, and whatnot. And I do keep coming back to reviewed.com. Um, and I'm going to jump ahead. I might come back to that slide. So reviewed.com actually um, is one of the testing companies. But look, there's our friends Aham again. Aham actually supplies a fabric swatch like this that has all of these items um, soaked into the fabric. And then those, they provide the testing companies with that swatch. And um, like, for instance, here, reviewed.com, there's others. But used um, that as their testing to test the wear and tear, the water retention, meaning like how much water spins out of the machine, and the stain removal and cycle time. So that's how these things are tested. And so I'm grateful to know that, again, I have some sources I can trust that I know these things are actually being tested um, appropriately, right? Because it really does depend who you're comparing against who and what level is entry level versus luxury and whatnot. So front load water, uh, washing machines, you are definitely saving water. So, you know, yay, yay you, you chose a front loader. Um, top load machines often, uh, and this is what I'm beginning to maybe think about some of my aging in place clients. The top load machine oftentimes has a simplified control panel that may be easier for them to understand because it's what they're used to. Um, front loaders, often you have to read the manual to learn how to program and run the cycle. Now, I know that's true, not true of all of them. You know, it's, um, you know, every generation and, 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 of course, but we need to take into account universal design as we are specifying appliances. And I don't know about you, and I didn't say this at the very beginning, but washing machines, laundry, was not high on my list with all the appliance education that I've gotten. With laundry, washer and dryer, for some reason, was not one of the ones that I have been got, have, had gotten a lot of um, education on. And now I hope to change that. It was really difficult to not talk about the dryer uh, because the dryer and the washing machine definitely go hand in hand. Um, and we are not talking about the dryer today. So sanitize, sanitizing, again, with washing machines, uh, the standard, some of the standard temperature zones, warm being 104 degrees, hot 140, and extra hot 194. Uh, the American Society of Sanitary, Sanitary Engineering says this is for your home heater. Your home heater should actually be set to 135 to 140 um, to be able to destroy bacteria and viruses. Most textiles need to be up to kill um, bacteria. It needs to be at 160 degrees Fahrenheit for a minimum of 20, immersed in that hot water for a minimum of 25 minutes. So again, some of the, and I'm jumping ahead, some of the frustration points even with washing machines is the length of the cycle. And we just need to re-educate our clients that to reduce water, we have to increase the cycle for it to actually work. So, you know, get over it. <laughs> color, 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 color. Um, this is one of the things we don't get to talk about with dishwashers. You can put any, you know, cabinet panel on your dishwasher you want. Um, and, and certainly there are some fun ones that do come in color. But um, I last year just finished a laundry room with um, that, um, it was kind of that cherry red 
set, and we had tons of fun with the, the design palette there. Um, at the at KBiz this year, I saw um, this beautiful, and it's not picturing super well in this image, but it was kind of like a, a um, like a navy, like a navy blue that was really, um, really, really nice. I could have fun designing around that. Uh, some more frustration points with our clients. You know, uh, this is kind of becoming our theme for the day. Wouldn't it be great if we could blame all of our frustration on the machine and just blame the manufacturers that they don't know what they're doing? But they do. And it's user error, as always. <laughs> we are often using the wrong detergent, not sorting properly, we're overloading the machine, or we are, you know, using the wrong temperature. Um, selecting the wrong cycle and whatnot. And you know what this made me think of is we all need to have home ec classes again. I need a home ec class just to learn how to do laundry. <laughs> I have never claimed to be a laundry expert. Um, and I, maybe I need to change that because um, I do want my clothes to last longer now. So some more myths, and I, t I might have alluded to this earlier that, uh, and we've talked about this already, that a wash cycle should take less than an hour. Yeah, no, that's not, that time has come and gone. That time has come and gone, and we just need to accept where we are with that. So we need to reset our clients and ourselves, reset our expectations. Larger is not always better. Some of the larger machines, um, they say, to, the manual will say only fill at 50%. Others, um, the smaller machines you want to fill to the top. And as we are winding down a few things here, I know I'm keeping an eye on the time here, um, and I will stay on afterwards for Q&A because I, um, yeah, I will stay on after for Q&A. Uh, the bellows gasket, I just like how that sounds, the bellows gasket. So one of the complaints is the smell, right? And it's in, you know, uh, detergent and maybe the sock gets stuck in this around the door of the washer and that's what creates the smell. Um, there's a company on the market now that has this new, they're creating that bellows gasket out of a, uh, a material that will um, like naturally fight, you know, the bacteria, uh, which will reduce the smell. If you have a traditional one that doesn't have that new fancy feature, um, you can copy and paste this. You'll get it in the slides later. Um, I need to practice this here at home. Um, this great recipe to help keep your... <laughs> Yes, a recipe for your washing machine um, to get your, uh, your washing machine fresh and to maintain it. Again, user, user participation to keep our uh, washing machines fresh. Um, most of us are using way too much dish, uh, detergent. And so in the luxury market, they're beginning to do things like, you know, smart dispense, load and go, auto dose, um, you know, the cartridges that come from the manufacturer that you're inputting into the machine. So all you have to do is hit the button, the setting you want, and then it automatically knows what, how much detergent to use. Reviewed.com, um, with your dishwashers, if you have a um, high efficiency uh, washing machine, sorry, um, you definitely want to be using detergents that have that HE label on them. And you can refer back to this later with your clients and yourselves to find uh, this was a fresh uh, 2020 uh, report on some of the best detergents. Also, don't worry, our eco-friendly eco um, detergents, also the same list for 2020. Um, and you can, again, have that list later. Okay, we are nearly done here. Just wanna wrap up with leak detection for the washing machine, just like we did with the dishwasher. Um, water damage is five times more likely than theft, and six times more likely than fire. So I went to Cedia last year, uh, the Cedia show, and got educated on all kinds of things. And I found, I discovered The Guardian there. I think they were one of the first ones. There may be other companies now that not only is it detecting and notifying you, but it's going that extra third step and it's turning the water off at the source. 
just found that Moen actually has a uh, feature as well for our homes. And I love these, you can put them around the home at all the different water points um, that again notifies you and um, has a shutoff. So we need to be specifying these. Just like you specify a garbage disposal to your clients, we now really need to be thinking about the leak detection um, and these features when we're specifying dishwashers and washing machines. Yes, many of the new ones are connected and accessible and online. Wrapping up with future of our washing machines, you know, again, I wouldn't mind having the robot do the laundry for me. Um, you know, steam, I think, is going to play a key role in moving forward, the steam and heat. Um, so we, let's, it'll be interesting to keep an eye on the future there. Um, I, this was one of the things that I found at KBiz this year, and maybe some of you saw it as well. Um, it's an air dresser. And as I'm thinking about wanting to reduce dry cleaning and increase the lifespan or just, you know, freshen up that outfit that I only wore once, right? Um, again, we're using steam and air and to kind of deodorize and sanitize clothes without washing, especially any of our delicates and things. Um, but the guy who was demoing it was even saying, you know, throw all your lacrosse stuff in and like, oh God, yeah. At my sister's house, they have a house full of guys that do lacrosse. Um, what I loved that Samsung did here was that it was um, expense-wise or, or cost-wise, it, it's accessible to the market. Um, it's not just, you know, for the, hot, for the rich and famous that we, we, I could actually afford to do this as well. Um, and LG has one as well. So, Thank you uh, for uh, uh, going through this journey with me. Um, I know I touched on a lot of things and um, I, um, I look forward to, you know, you receiving the video um, or the audio and the slides um, at the end after you do your survey as well. Um, Cause I know there's a lot of content in here that you can refer back to. And I will find that link and um, put that in the comments. And let's open it up for Q&A again. Gebrit, thank you so much for your sponsorship for the month of April. We really appreciate it. And I know Debbie's been back there collecting questions that have come up. And, you know, if I can't answer them, we'll find it together. Can't say that I'm an expert on everything. <laughs> I don't know if any of us are. All right. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you, everyone. Okay. So, Paula, there are some questions, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, so, going back, we, you were talking about the dishwashers, and someone said that they recommend the lowest bells and whistles, so you can get the get on the most expensive machines. I'm sorry, I'm not saying this right. We rec recommend the lowest bells and whistles you can get um, instead of the most expensive, uh -huh. um, because you can afford a, a better. Because bells and whistles are the first to break. Is that still true? So, you know, um, you saw how much I tried to cram into here, and you should have seen me last night and how many slides I had to cut. Um, one of the ones that I cut was, um, I'm trying to, I, I am paste, I'm pasting the link into the chat message right now. That was for that 360 degree. Um, there you go. Okay. Oh, thank so, you. as I was talking to Andrew at the appliance store, he kept coming back to Speed Queen. The Speed Queen, you know, um, laundry, uh, laundry machine, which I'm, I'm like, that looks like what they have at hotels. Or that looks a little, that, aren't, isn't that commercial? And he said, no, they have a residential model. And he's like, they're really, they're really, really super good. But yeah, they're kind of a stripped down version, but they use a lot less water and they are way more affordable. So thank you for bringing that up. That can be very true for those of us that can't all afford the, the luxury lines, right? Thank you. Yeah. And so someone was just commenting about the, the size of the jet holes. Again, the dishwasher jet holes mm -hmm. makes a difference. They said that the smaller the hole, it's more forceful. So that was just exactly. a comment. And then the, you. the same, you're welcome. The same person, I think, said uh, that there are, when you were talking about that steam that's coming out from under the countertops, mm -hmm. Uh, he said there are con condensation strips that go under countertops to protect from moisture damage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and someone was joking, and they said, can you please tell my husband about not 
pre-rinsing the dishes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, seriously, I think I need, we need a home ec class, you guys. I think we've gone too many different, too many generations without having home ec classes at, at uh, and I, you know. I, ha- I have to laugh because someone, an educator put in here, I, she attends our webinars regularly, and she said, laugh out loud. She said, those courses are now called family and consumer science classes yeah. since 1999. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think I might um, know who that see. is. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Someone said that they think the best dishwashers are European made because they fill with cold water. Do you have any thoughts on that? So that was fascinating to me because I asked the same question. I'm like, what about this whole like hooked up to cold water? And there was one that was um, European a while ago that only hooked up to cold water. And when I went back and did my research on that manufacturer, they actually offer both um, both here in the States, we, we primarily are hooking up to hot water. Um, think about if you cooked up to cold, how much longer the, the dishwasher is going to have to work to heat. You're wasting so much more water and energy by hooking up to cold. So we are really moving, if not all, um, moving towards. And there is one of the luxury brands um, that I talked with that's really brand new is all U.S. Uh, all made in the U.S., um, by the way, as well. But now get the ones that are hooked up to hot. Okay. Um, so then there was a comment here about that cold water helped clean high-protein items on dishes yeah. where hot water bakes it on, so uh, well, cleaning high-protein. I Okay. There could be some, you know, give and take on that. I think it's also all about the detergent. Okay, so here's one. Have you heard of a dishwasher that is too hot? She says, my 15-year-old Bosch is so hot that it melts all the print off my cheaper mugs, so I only use a delicate cycle. She says, I worry about putting newer with the new dishwashers with an extra hot heat cycle and what it will do to my more expensive uh, items like spoon or souvenir mugs or holiday dishes, et cetera. Um, she says, I also so, don't use the dryer cycle. Do you have to save energy? Okay. Do you have any thoughts on that? So um, I would check your hot water heater at the house to see what the temperature is set at Okay. first. I would do that first. Um, I would definitely not ever select like the sanitizing cycle because that one is going to jump uh, temperature wise. Um, but the deter- for the detergent to work properly, it, they have to hit that 140 degree mark. Um, but I wonder if your hot water heater is set too high. Um, and there are gentle cycles. There are shorter cycles. Um, it depends, of course, on which manufacturer. What, what dishwasher do you have? You know, it all depends. Um, the newer models are not melting my plastic dish, my plastic Tupperware anymore like they used to. Yeah, so, so I haven't comment here, uh, Paul, if I may interject. Um, someone said uh, 120 is the normal incoming temp to appliances. There you go. So have her check her hot water heater if it's coming in <clears throat> too high. Maybe that's what's getting that scalding. Um, are you saving energy by not doing, I think that's what we all thought, and that was, you know, we all turned that drying feature off with older mo- dishwasher models because it would melt my Tupperware dish, you know, Tupperware. My Tupperware doesn't get melted anymore, and I leave the dryer setting. I let the dryer setting go all the way. so The dishes are dry by the time I get them out. Um, Are we saving energy? You know, there are eco settings on some of the new uh, luxury brands that we could be using. Um, I would need to do a little bit more research on uh, the energy implications of the heating cycle, and or I bet you there's a manufacturer or two sitting on this webinar who might answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's someone here that's asking, I've always understood that the best reason for not rinsing the dishes is that the enzymes and detergent need food waste to work properly. Is that true? That is still true. Yes, that is still true. So in addition to saving water, we are helping the detergent to actually do its job. Yes. Okay. Uh, so then someone's asking about um, considering an aging in place client. Well, what do you feel is easier for them to access their clothes, a front loader unit on a pedestal or a top loader unit? 
if a front loader is on a pedestal, mm -hmm. that's fabulous. Because now I mean, I'm tall and I hate, I hate some of the low front loaders. Um, but the top load, like reaching all the way down into the bottom to get the stuff off, you know, that can be a challenge too. So um, a front load on a pedestal and or build um, a platform so that you can customize the height for the user. Okay, that's a good point. Um, so someone was saying something about they've had a Speed Queen washing machine for several years um, mm -hmm. after owning two high-end front loaders. They say the Speed Queen is superior, so just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> yep, <laughs> I know, and I was like, wait, well, that's not the luxury market. I can't talk about that one. But it was like the, my, my appliance guy's favorite one. I'm like, <laughs> okay. And up until about yeah. midnight last night, I still had that slide in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's okay. I have a gentleman here that he's saying that he wants to um, to work with you. <laughs> hey. um, yeah. So I will I will definitely uh, share your information tomorrow so that he can reach out to you because uh, yes. he said he was a an appliance technician for ten years and he has some some thoughts for you. So oh, so fantastic. Yeah. I mean, uh, I could take this CEU and split it into two and then dive a lot more into design in the home and installation and then I could add dryers to the to the water. This was just like my first, yeah. That was yeah, a great way to start. Good. This is good. So I have another one here. What is the average cycle time of a new washer? Uh, she says I've had oh, client yeah. complaints that there doesn't seem to be a shorter cycle. Is this true of most new machines? What's the average Wash cycle time for washing machines? Yes. So um, there will be there are settings, and it always is going to depend on which manufacturer you get. Um, there are settings that can have shorter uh, cycles, eco cycles that are shorter. Um, uh, there are quick, well, quick, quick rinse, that's dishwashers. Um, it's all about, we need to kind of pay more attention to the cycle of the, the what am I trying to say? The cycles that the manufacturer offers. Yeah. But we also need to just, like I said, suck it up. You know, with today cycles are longer because there's less water. They have to run longer. I've noticed that too with my own dishwasher. They, it runs longer than the old one I had, but it uses less water. I can tell just by listening to the sound. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. sit by it, you know, but you, mm -hmm. you can tell that it's using less water. Yeah. That makes sense. So, yeah, yeah this, the, the gentleman that was the appliance um, <clears throat> person, he's saying that, be queen is solid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it looks it, too. It's not sexy. <laughs> <laughs> and others, of course, are putting in here different brands, but um, I won't get into that. Um, and someone said some brands offer as quick as 15-minute wash for laundry, but the load size would need to be smaller. So, like mm -hmm. you said, it, it varies by uh, manufacturer. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I see a question there. Uh, what are my feelings regarding dishwasher drawers and energy efficiency and aging in place? I obviously I totally did not go into like installation or design um, in our kitchens, but I love dishwasher drawers. I love being able to, to separate them and put one on each side of the sink or one in the, you know, by the prep sink. Um, they're fantastic for aging in place. Energy efficient. Yeah. If there's only a couple of you in the home and you don't need to fill it up every time. Although most dishwashers have like that eco setting um, or a small load or a quick wash if there's not that many dishes. Remember, okay, remember that now our dishwashers have that turbidity sensor and it will, it, if there's fewer dishes in there, there's less dirt and food, right? So the turbidity sensor will know it can do a shorter load because there's less Particles and food particles in there, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so here's some kudos to you, my friend. So, um, this person saying, I just wanted to let Paula know that I really enjoyed her presentation. Fun to listen to, uh, and informative. Probably my favorite seminar I've attended. <gasps> hours of CUs I've done this Oh, break. bless your heart. Bless <laughs> your heart. Thank you. <laughs> and there's lots of other kudos in here, but um, the great presentation, et cetera. So, um, so I know we're way over uh, time here at this point, and I apologize we haven't gotten to everybody's questions. Um, but I want to thank you so much, Paula, and, and of course, Gabrielle. Yes, and all absolutely. Of you out there. And here's my email, um, paulakennedy at outlook.com, and 
Um, yes, I have been gratefully um, supplying CEUs for NKBA chapters across the country, and I do virtual, obviously. Um, so um, uh, I know a lot of our NKBA speakers are becoming more comfortable with, with virtual, but I am able to visit your chapter, chapter virtually um, this year as well. This is great, Paula. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much for everything, your time, your expertise, and all of you out there. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Have a good day.